What's going on everybody? Chris here from projectoption.com and in today's video we're going to take a look at short put management results from over 41,000 trades and this is basically just a very extensive back test that we did on short put positions in the S&P 500 and I encourage you to watch the entire video because I guarantee you you are going to have some very valuable takeaways from these results. Now the short put option strategy is very popular among optimistic investors and traders who have a bullish outlook for a particular stock, but also don't mind buying shares if the stock price falls. Now in this particular video, we're going to examine over 10 years of short put management data from over 41,000 trades in the S&P 500 ETF, which is the ticker symbol SPY. Now in this video, we're gonna answer the questions, which strategies were the most profitable, which were the least profitable, and lastly, how did implied volatility at the time of entering these trades historically impact the profitability? So when you factor in implied volatility, which of these short put management combinations actually performed the best and which performed the worst? So let's get into the study methodology and then get right into the results. So as mentioned previously, we use the S&P 500 ETF, which is the ticker symbol SPY. Now we're looking at results from January 2007 to May 2017, and that's the most recent standard expiration cycle as of this recording. Now we're looking at trade entry dates on every single trading day to maximize the amount of data that we're analyzing, and we're choosing the expiration cycle that is closest to 45 days to expiration and is a standard expiration cycle. So that means we're not looking at weeklies and we're not looking at quarterly expiration cycles. We're looking at that standard expiration cycle closest to 45 days to expiration. Now the exact trade that we're going to look at is selling the 16 delta put option. Now that means we're looking to sell the put option with an approximate probability of expiring in the money of 16%. So that 16 delta put option has a 16% estimated probability of being in the money at expiration. Now we're going to look at just one contract to keep things simple. Now for every single trade entry, we're going to test 16 different management combinations. We're going to do profit or expiration, so that means either 25% of maximum profit, 50%, 75%, or held to expiration if none of those profit targets were hit. Now we're also going to test three different loss taking categories, so we're going to test the 25, 50, and 75% profit levels against a 100%, 200%, and 300% stop loss. So let's go through a quick example to show you what these numbers actually mean. So for example, let's say we're looking at the 50% profit or negative 200% loss management combination. Now if the entry credit of that put option is $1, that means we're going to be targeting an exit point of 50 cents to buy back that put option. And that comes from the $1 entry credit times 50%, which comes out to 50 cents. So with a 50 cent profit target, if we subtract that from the entry credit of $1, that means we would look to buy back this put option for 50 cents. Now in this particular example, we have a loss limit of 200%, which means we're willing to lose 200% of the premium that we initially collected, or $2 in this case. So since we collected $1, a 200% loss would be when we lose $2 on the trade. Now a $2 loss would occur when the short put option trades $3. So since we sold it for $1, if it hits $3, then we would be down $2 on the trade, at which point we would close the put option. Now let's quickly cover the metrics we'll analyze before diving into the results. So first and foremost, we're going to start off with win rates, which is just the percentage of trades that were profitable. Now the second metric we're going to look at is the win rate minus break-even win rate, which is just the difference between the success rate and what the strategy required in order to break even. Now that break-even win rate is based on average profits and average losses. So for example, if a strategy had a win rate of 90% but required an 85% win rate to break even, then that, that would come out to a 5% win rate minus break-even win rate. Now the third metric we're going to look at is the average P&L, which is just the average profitability of each trade. After that, we'll take a look at the 10th percentile P&L, which is the P&L level that 90% of trades exceeded. Now that's just a probabilistic way of analyzing the worst case drawdowns of each management combination. Now the last thing we're going to look at is the 45 day adjusted P&L, and that's because not all trades were held for the same amount of time. 
So since some trades are managed for profits or losses early, we wanted to normalize the average PL of each of those approaches to a similar time period. So we just took the average PL and then extrapolated that into a 45 day window based on the average amount of time each trade was held. All right, so let's get into the win rates for all 16 different short put management strategies. Now, as we would expect, the management approaches that included taking profits earlier saw a boost in the success rate because taking smaller profits is more likely than taking larger profits out of these short put trades. Now, on the other hand, compared to not taking any losses, the loss taking approaches did have a reduction in the amount of successful trades. And that's because if you take losses early on a trade, some of those trades are going to end profitable, which means your success rate will be reduced. Now we're going to take a look at the win rates relative to the break-even win rates to see if these high win rates actually mean anything. Now despite having the highest success rates, taking profits earlier resulted in the lowest margin over the required break-even win rate. Now, for example, if we look at the 25% profit target or expiration management combination, we see that the win rate minus break-even win rate was 2.2%. Now that means that if that win rate was 2.2% lower, the strategy would have broken even over time based on the average profits and average losses of that strategy. Now that's because when you take profits at 25% and you let your losses run, you have really, really small profits, but you have the occasional huge loss. Now with really small profits and big losses, you need your strategy's success rate to be ridiculously high, which we can see by looking at these figures. Now the expiration short put management strategies actually had the highest win rates relative to the break even win rates, which stems from the fact that these trades had the highest profits on average relative to the smaller losses on average. So by having those larger profits relative to your losses, you actually need less winning trades to make up for those losses and therefore these strategies had a lower required break-even win rate. Now as we can see the expiration or loss management combinations actually had the highest success rates relative to the break-even win rates which suggests that just by letting your profits run and by managing your losses and keeping them contained that resulted in the highest win rate relative to what was required to break even over time. Now that win rate minus break even win rate relationship should bleed over to the average PL per trade. So let's go ahead and take a look at the numbers. Now as we can see here, the expiration approaches had the highest average PL per trade and the management combinations that included taking profits at 25 or 50% of the maximum profit actually had the lowest average PL per trade in each group. Now that's obviously because if you take profit sooner, your average profit per trade is smaller, but you're also keeping those loss levels the same because in the case of the expiration loss management, you're actually not taking losses, but in the case of the other stop loss categories, you are keeping those loss levels the same while taking smaller and smaller profits. Now you might be thinking that you should just sell a 16 delta put and hold to expiration based on that average P&L being the highest in the expiration category, but that's actually not true because we don't have all the necessary information yet. We need to look at the worst drawdowns in each approach, and then we also need to factor in how many trades we can actually make in a 45 day period which with each of these approaches. So not all of these trades were held for the same amount of time. So we need to factor that in by looking at a 45 day average PL adjustment. So let's start by looking at the 10th percentile PL, or in other words, the worst case drawdowns in each approach. Now when we look at these worst case drawdowns, we can see that the approaches that did not take any losses had substantially worse drawdowns than the approaches that did take losses. So even though that expiration approach had an average PL of $53 per trade, the 90 or the 10th percentile PL was $1,900, which means the lowest 10% of trades had drawdowns worse than $1,900. Now, if you look at the expiration or negative 300% approach, we can see that the 10th percentile PL was negative $561, which is almost four times better than that expiration only approach. So if you go back and look at the average PL of that expiration or negative 300% short put management approach, you'll see that the average PL is around $48.
So by looking at the drawdowns and the average P&L, we can see that some of these loss-taking approaches actually are much better in terms of risk and reward than simply holding to expiration. Now let's go ahead and look at the average time in trade and 45-day adjusted P&L figures. Now by looking at the average time in trade, we can clearly see that by taking profits early or by taking losses early, we have a much lower average time in each trade. So knowing that some of these approaches are only in a trade for 8 days and some are in, in a trade for 23 days, we need to adjust the average P&L per trade to a 45 day window to see which of these strategies has the highest expectancy in a similar period of time. So on this chart we're actually looking at the average 45 day P&L and that's calculated by taking the average P&L of each approach times 45 divided by the average number of days in trade. So if the average number of days in a trade was 15 days, we would essentially multiply the average P&L per trade by 3 since we can do 3 15-day trades in each 45-day period. Now while this is not a perfect way to calculate this, it does give us some context around you know, how each of these strategies performs in similar periods of time. So now when we analyze the average profitability of each approach over a 45-day period, we can see that by taking profits at 25 or 50 percent of the maximum profit potential, those approaches have the highest expectancy over a 45-day period. However, keep in mind that by managing your profits earlier, you're ultimately going to be trading more often, which is going to generate more commission fees. So. I believe there is a happy medium between less occurrences and less commissions and more occurrences and more commissions. So personally I would probably opt for that 50% profit target level with some loss management and that's just my personal preference because I don't really like to, tr like to manage these way out of the money short premium trades at 25% of the profit target. Now additionally these figures do not account for the fact that when you take profits on a short put position and then sell a new 16 delta put, you're most likely rolling up to a higher strike price. Now that means your bullish assumption is basically more aggressive and if the stock market turns around and reverses after you roll up that put option, you'd have larger losses on the downside than if you would have held that initial short put position and held out for a higher profit target. So these are just some things to keep in mind. All right, so now that we've looked at the most important metrics related to each, each short put management combination, we need to go ahead and filter by VIX. So we need to look at how these approaches performed in various implied volatility environments, and we're basing that off of the VIX level at the time of entering the trade. Now I encourage you to watch this next section because this is where the most valuable takeaways are from this whole study. So we evenly divided all of the occurrences into four VIX buckets based on the VIX level at the time of trade entry. Now here were the VIX levels that we chose for the dividing lines between each of these different buckets. So the four buckets are VIX below 14, VIX between 14 and 17 and a half, VIX between 17 and a half and 23 and a half, and VIX above 23 and a half. Now these levels were chosen based on the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile of VIX levels at the time of entering these trades, which give us, gives us four evenly divided buckets with a very similar number of trades in each environment. So let's start by looking at the win rates by VIX level. Now when looking at these win rates, we can see that there's not really any screaming takeaways for each approach based on the VIX at entry other than the fact that some of these approaches have the highest win rates in the lowest and highest VIX environment. So how did the win rates in each environment compare to the breakeven win rates that were required based on the average profits and average losses? Now this chart is very interesting because we can see that the win rates that had the highest win rates relative to the breakeven win rates lied in the lowest VIX entries when you were just taking profits and not taking any losses. However, the largest win rate minus breakeven win rate relationships were observed in the highest VIX entries for the loss taking approaches. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the average P&L figures to see if this relationship transfers over to the average profitability of each approach. Now when looking at the average P&L per trade based on the VIX environment at entry, it's very interesting to see that the more passive profit taking approaches combined with a loss taking approach 
have historically had the highest profitability per trade in the high VIX entries. So when the market is more volatile and the VIX is at a higher level, by selling that option and taking that risk, the most reward has come from either letting your profits run for profitable trades or by being aggressive about you know, managing the drawdowns and taking losses early. Now let's dive a little bit deeper and figure out why these results are the way they are by looking at the worst drawdowns by VIX level at entry. Now when we analyze these worst drawdowns for each short put management approach, it's very clear to see that the largest losses, historically speaking, have occurred in the high VIX entries. Now that's because there's a direct relationship between how volatile the market is, so what the historical volatility of the S&P 500 is, relative to the VIX level. So when the market is more volatile and it's fluctuating more and more on a daily basis, that means historical volatility or realized volatility in the market is high, and therefore the VIX is going to be trading at higher multiples. Now additionally, as the market starts falling, the VIX starts to increase, which means some of these short put trades were selling into a substantial market drawdown, which of course is not good for a short put position. So by selling a put option in that high VIX environment and collecting that rich premium, when you are more aggressive about taking losses, that has historically helped you in terms of average profitability. So now that we know the average profitability and worst case drawdowns for each management approach by VIX level, let's finish by looking at the 45 day adjusted P&L by VIX level and see if we can come to any conclusions. Now when adjusting for the number of trades per 45 day period, the high VIX entries with loss management rules seem to stand out the most. So by taking profits early and taking losses, we actually have the highest 45 day average profitability in the high VIX entries. So this is a very interesting takeaway and it really shows that when you sell options or sell puts in a high VIX environment, it has historically been a value adding decision to take losses on those positions because the largest losses in history have stemmed from selling options in high VIX environments. Now we've covered a ton of data in this video, so let's go ahead and quickly summarize the key findings from all of this research. So as mentioned previously, the highest average P&L by VIX level has historically lied with the high VIX entries when combined with a large profit target and a loss limit. So when you sell options in that high VIX environment, it has been a good decision, historically speaking, to take losses on those positions because the worst drawdowns have occurred in the highest VIX entries. Now while we also see some very attractive average P&L figures for the profit and no loss taking approaches in the low VIX environments, I would never advise anyone to sell put options without any protection and not take losses because in the future there will likely be some disastrous trades that really drag down these current results. So be sure to keep that in mind. Thank you so much for watching this video everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please go ahead and give this video a like, drop a comment down below, and subscribe to our channel so that you can get all of our future options trading videos and research right when we upload them.